So this week we're going to talk about something known as the Secure Controls Framework. Now, I've heard about this for quite some time from several colleagues. Uh, I heard about it in my uh, previous role when uh, I was at uh, Rapid7 as the Chief Security Officer. My compliance team was talking about leveraging the Secure Controls Framework. I actually thought it was something they, uh, the team actually had created and it was just their own acronym. And then one of my uh, compliance colleagues recently over the past year, uh, year and a half at Tricentis uh, also mentioned the Secure Controls Framework. And so recently I decided to dive in and learn a bit more. I did, I did learn a bit about the Secure Controls Framework over the last year, but I thought I would just go right to the source, the actual Secure Controls Framework Council, uh, get a copy off of their document, their handbook, their guide, read it, and as I'm learning it, share it with y'all. That's the plan here. So I got myself a Google Slides deck in front of me, and I will let you know this entire uh, slide deck is derived directly from the Secure Controls Framework Start Here Guide. That's what it's called, the Start Here Guide. And I'm going to introduce us to this thing called Secure's Controls, Secure Controls Framework, SCF. It's an overview for managing compliance and security programs. And I will, uh, you know, if you're looking at this saying, maybe it's time for me to check out, like, keep in mind, I have now come to realize that the Secure Controls Framework will be very helpful for your GRC teams, for your compliance teams, your compliance managers. But it will also be very helpful to your security program teams who are looking at tr trying to determine where are our most risky areas? Where are the areas where we have most risk that we need to spend more time securing, protecting, educating the executive team, educating the board, educating ourselves? Um, so I'm, go I'm going to say this pretty loudly that this is going to be valuable not just for your compliance folks, which is what I initially thought, but also for your security program folks. So let us get into it. So this is going to take us uh, through today and into next week's episode as well. I'm going to give an overview of the Secure Controls Framework. Uh, as I started to look at this framework, uh, I looked at their guide, and what I saw was seven different areas of focus. And so I broke this presentation into seven areas of focus. Uh, so today we're going to talk and focus on the first three. You'll see there's three here, and then there's a line, and then there's four below it. So I'm kind of telling you what we're going to talk about now, and then what we're going to talk about next time we get together. So uh, for today, we're going to talk about what is and what is not SCF, Secure Control Framework. Um, adopting secure by design principles. I'm excited about this because I had someone uh, about a year and a half ago bring the title S. XD, capital S, little x, capital D, secure by design, and then also SXP, oh wait, uh, no, no, sorry, P, <laughs> the other one was PXD, capital P, little x, big D, privacy by design, and I thought this was a person who was making up something really cool, a cool little acronym, what I didn't realize until just this week when I started reading the Secure Control Framework Guide was these are terms that are right in, in the SCF guide. Maybe they're elsewhere. I just didn't know them until this week. I knew them a year and a half ago. I thought they were a homemade term. Now I know they're everywhere. So we'll talk about that. And then finally today we will get into integrated controls management, um, ICM. So I'm, I, won't, I won't give us too much of a detail of what that is. And then the four sections below that are more how to use SCF. So today's more of an intro of what is it? Why does it exist? Why should I care? And then next time when we get together, we'll talk about some practical uses, how to implement, where to implement, why to implement it. So we'll, we'll continue on. So yes, I have a wall of words on some of these slides and I do not plan to read the slides. I have more uh, information that I've actually taken my own notes on. So yeah, you have your wall of words, but you'll see a lot of my slides have more have, have quite a bit of visuals as well as words. So hopefully you get something that's worth paying attention to here. And if you're just listening to the audio, well, now you hear my sweet, sweet voice and nothing more. So the SCF Best Practices Guide, it covers the following topics. 
level setting what the SCF is and what it is not, integrated controls management or ICM, the integrated controls management approach to governance, risk management and compliance or as I just recently said GRC, leveraging the security and privacy capability maturity model SPCMM, Leveraging the Security and Privacy Risk Management Model, SPRMM, and recommendations to tailor the control set for your needs to operationalize the SCF. It's a whole lot of acronyms in there. whole lot of acronyms. The SCF Controls Framework Overview and Instructions document is designed for cybersecurity and privacy practitioners to gain an understanding of how to use the SCF how it is the SCF is intended to be used in their organization. So cybersecurity professionals and privacy professionals. So that's kind of cool. So uh, if, if privacy falls into your court, great. If privacy falls into the court of your legal team and you work really closely with legal, this might be something you could bring to them if they're not familiar with this. So you could, uh, you could help your legal team here and help educate them and partner up even more. So let's get into the first section. What is and what is not SCF? So why use the SCF? First off, it's free. The, you don't have to pay. I and mean, we'll talk about that for just a second. It's kind of important to note because there are a lot of frameworks out there uh, that actually charge you for their documentation. The ISO frameworks, you have to pay you know, a small amount of money, like hundred or hundreds of dollars uh, to get ISO documentation. There's a company out there, Compliance Forge, which has lots of the compliance documentation. It's not for free. Um, but the SCF, it's free. So there's that. All you have to do is just go download the documents and the frameworks, and it's yours to use. <clears throat> Here's another reason why to use SCF. Does your company have three or more compliance requirements? For example, uh, are you required to do ISO 27001 compliance or do you want to do ISO 27001 compliance and you currently aren't because it's too large of a burden with all of your other compliance requirements like SOC 2 or PCI or GDPR, right? If you have three or more compliance requirements, SCF might be for you. If you notice in all of that acronym soup that I just mentioned a second ago, ISO, SOC, PCI, GDPR, some of those are security and some of those are privacy. They cross over here. All, right. uh, all well-known security and privacy frameworks have been analyzed and considered for incorporation. So here's a cool thing. We'll get into all of this. Um, the frameworks I just mentioned up above, the security frameworks above, the privacy frameworks above, and many more that you might have in your, in your noggin right now um, have been analyzed by the SCF team and incorporated into the Secure Controls Framework, which is very cool. Um, the SCF is made up of over a hundred control. I'm sorry, over a thousand controls. There's a thousand controls in the SCF. So if you think about um, the CIS critical security controls, uh, that's 18. It's 18 main controls and then some sub controls. SCF is a thousand. So that could be extremely overwhelming to say a thousand's too many. I'll stick with the S, uh, the CIS. Or I'll stick with the NIST cybersecurity framework, which is, uh, I forget, but isn't it like 140? We'll go with 140. I'll make that number up. ISO is a whole bunch more, like 300 maybe. Uh, what SCF is, is all of those controls of all those frameworks into one big old big ass framework. Um, and then finally, the hard part of mapping SCS, SCF back to the compliance frameworks, it's already done. Like that's kind of the cool part of SCF. It took all the frameworks you could imagine assessed all of them, figured out which ones had repeating and overlapping controls and aligned them, and those that didn't have overlapping controls just added them to the list, and now there's a thousand controls in one framework. So if you're a company that uses multiple security and privacy frameworks or wants to for whatever reason, maybe it helps you with your competitive advantage to have more compliance checkboxes, Maybe your security operations team wants to use one type of framework and your application security and product security team wants to use a different framework, but your security leadership team is overwhelmed by all these different frameworks. Maybe your security leadership team can just focus on this one. Think about it. Maybe your GRC team who's trying to do compliance across many different compliance frameworks is overwhelmed 
And instead of having them point to many different frameworks, you point them to the one, the SCF. So there's the why. I'm now getting this, by the way. I'm learning this as we go. I'm not an SCF expert. Uh, I just play one on TV. So what is SCF? The SCF is a comprehensive catalog of controls that is designed to enable companies to design, build, and maintain secure processes, systems, and applications. The SCF addresses both cybersecurity and privacy so that these principles are designed to be baked in at the strategic, operational, and tactical levels. The SCF also contains helpful guidance on possible tools and solutions to address controls. Additionally, it contains maturity criteria that can help an organization plan for and evaluate controls based on a target maturity level. Okay, cool. So what SCF is not? What is it not? If it is all these things, what is it not? The SCF is a comprehensive catalog of controls, right? This We, we said what it is, but what is it not? Right? It's not a substitute for performing due diligence uh, or understanding your compliance needs. It's not a substitute for that. It's not a complete solution for your needs, right? It's a gui it, There's a guide and it's a framework, but it's not a complete solution. Uh, what I would say if you're saying, oh, I really would like just a full solution, uh, go look at the GRC tools out in the marketplace. I'm only going to name one that just comes to mind because I know it fairly well. Zen GRC um, has the SCF integrated into it. I will just say this without being certain. I think Logic Gate, Logic Gate also does. But if you want like an all-in-one tool that takes this framework and implements it into a product, go look at the GRC uh, tool marketplace and uh, ask your vendors, hey, uh, is SCF in your tool? And you know, do you guys really believe in SCF? Is this a big important thing for you? And and there's your there's your potential complete technology solution. Uh, also, what is it not? It's not infallible. It's not guaranteed to meet every compliance requirement that every organization needs. But I will tell you this from my experience. Nearly everything's in the SCF. Uh, there are some compliance areas that might not be in there. Like, say, ISO 9001. I'm not certain if ISO 9001 is in the SCF. Uh, ISO 9001 is quality management, so it's not necessarily security or privacy. So it might be a different compliance framework that's not in there. And there will always be new security and privacy frameworks that may or may not make their way into uh, the framework. So, uh, you know, just keep that in mind that it's not a guarantee. But. So we'll get into it a little bit more. Let me bring the other slide here. Designing and building an audit-ready program. Right, a lot of this is focused on, in, and a lot of us get our investment from our leadership teams uh, for compliance and audit, right? To be able to demonstrate to the industry, to demonstrate to our customers, to demonstrate to our partners that we take security and privacy, privacy seriously. Whenever you see a data breach, that's probably the first line you see. We take security and privacy seriously. So let's get into this. Designing and building an audit-ready program. Building an audit-ready cybersecurity and privacy program requires addressing the holistic nature of security and privacy concerning how people, processes, technology, and data impact existing security and data protection practices. Building a security program that routinely incorporates security and privacy practices into daily operations requires a mastery of the basics. A useful analogy is with the child's toy, the children's toy, Lego. It says that in the document. It actually says the children's toy, Lego. I was playing with Legos last week, so just saying. Uh, with Lego, you can build nearly anything you want, either through following directions or using your own creativity. However, it first requires an understanding of how various Lego shapes either snap together or are incompatible. Once you master the fundamentals with Lego... It's easy to keep building and become immensely creative since you know how everything interacts. However, 
When the fundamentals are ignored, the Lego structure will be weak and includes systemic flaws. Security and privacy really are not much different, since those disciplines are made up of numerous blocks that all come together to build secure systems and processes. The lack of building blocks will lead to insecure and poorly architected solutions. When you envision each component that makes up a security or privacy best practice is a Lego block, it's possible to conceptualize how certain requirements are the foundations that form the basis for other components to attach to. Only when all the building blocks come together and take shape do you get a functional security and privacy program. Think of the SCF as a toolkit for you to build out your overall security program domain by domain so that cybersecurity and privacy principles are designed, implemented, and managed by default. Okay, I'm following. I'm digging. Move on to the next section here. Adopting secure by design principles. I mentioned this at the top. SXD. For an organization that just does ISO, if all you do is ISO, it's easy to say, well, we're an ISO shop and we exclusively use ISO 27001. Cybersecurity principles for an information security management system. Uh, and that would be routinely accepted as being adequate as a reasonable path to follow for many organizations. However, what about companies that have complex cybersecurity and compliance needs, such as a company that has to address SOC 2, NIST 800-171, ISO 27002, CCPA, GDPR, PCI, DSS, New York DFS, etc. In these complex cases that involve multiple frameworks, ISO 27002 controls alone do not cut it. ISO 27001 controls alone do not cut it. This is why it's important to understand what secure principles your organization is aligned with so that the controls it implements are appropriate to build secure and compliant processes. What works for one company or industry does not necessarily work for another, since requirements are unique to the organization. Most companies have requirements to document security and privacy processes, but lack the knowledge and expertise to undertake such documentation efforts. That means organizations are faced to either outsource the work to expensive consultants, or they ignore the requirement and hope they do not get in trouble for being non-compliant. In either situation, it's not a good place to be. Secure practices are common expectations. While the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, or the EU GDPR, made headlines for requiring organizations to demonstrate security by security and privacy principles are by both default and by design. So we want security by default and security by design. And we want privacy by default and privacy by design. However, security and privacy engineering principles are not just limited to the EU GDPR and are actually very common requirements in things such as, and that's why you see all these pictures on here, the NIST 800-53, the NIST cybersecurity framework, ISO 27002, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations Supplements, or DFARS, the Federal Acquisition Regulations, FAR, the National Industrial Security Program Operating Manual, or NISPOM, the ISACA Trust Services Criteria, which is part of SOC 2, uh, the Generally Accepted Privacy Principles, GAP, uh, the New York State Department of Financial Services, DFS, the Payment Card Industry Data Protection Standard, PCI, DSS, the Center for Internet Sec uh, Security, Critical Security Controls, or the CIS. SCSC, my gosh, there are so many acronyms in this world, it's brutal. I'm saying the words out and the acronyms because I'm trying to not assume we all know them all. Most of those I knew, but there's actually quite a few I didn't know. There's a few in there that were new to me. Um, 
So yeah, that's pretty crazy. That's a lot of things going on. A lot of security, a lot of privacy. And what you saw in that picture was lots of security frameworks on the left side of the picture and lots of privacy frameworks on the right. Compliance does not equal secure. Compliance should be a natural byproduct of secure practices. It's vitally important for any SCF user to understand that compliant does not mean secure. However, if you design, build, and maintain secure systems, applications, and processes, then compliance should be a natural byproduct of those secure practices. The SCF's comprehensive listing of over 1,000 cybersecurity and privacy controls is categorized into 32 domains and are mapped to over 100 statutory, regulatory, and contractual frameworks. Those applicable SCF controls can operationalize the security and privacy principles to help an organization ensure that secure practices are implemented by design and by default. So you may be asking yourself, what security and privacy principles should I be using? And that is a great question. The SCF helped with this common question by taking the 32 domains of the SCF and creating principles that an organization can use. The idea is that by focusing on these secure principles, an organization will design, implement, and maintain secure systems, applications, and processes that will by default help the organization comply with its compliance obligations. And thank you, Ron, for being there for us. Ron. Secure by design and privacy by design principles. The concept of building security and privacy into technology solutions, both by default and by design, is a basic expectation for businesses, regardless of the industry. The adoption of security and privacy principles is a crucial step in building a secure, audit-ready program. The security and privacy by design is a set of 32 security and privacy principles that leverages the SCF's extensive cybersecurity and privacy control set. You can download the free poster uh, by going to the SCF uh, website and grabbing their document. Uh, I, I basically put them all on the screen here, and I'm actually going to spend the next few minutes walking through what these are Again, my whole reason for doing today's show is I am educating myself in real time on the SCF. I grabbed content and put together these slides and then thought, while I'm educating myself and learning, why not educate some friends along with me at the same time? So I'm going to get into this a little bit. The S Pipe P logo, you'll see it written S Pipe P logo um, or uh, I, I don't think I have it on the slide very much, but uh, it's a nod to uh, the computing definition or the pipe command, um, which is used in uh, in programming. So I think that's interesting. So I'm going to go through these 32 principles now, give us a little bit of an overview of what they are, and uh, just kind of introduce us to the key principles of the SCF. So number one, security and privacy governance. Uh, govern a documented risk-based program that encompasses appropriate security and privacy principles to address all applicable statutory, regulatory, and contractual obligations. Organizations specify the development of an organization's security and privacy programs, including criteria to measure success to ensure ongoing leadership, engagement, and risk management. Okay, sounds like compliance stuff. Uh, number two is asset management. Manage all technology assets from purchase through disposition, both physical and virtual, to ensure secured use regardless of the asset's location. Organizations ensure technology assets are properly managed throughout the life cycle of the asset from procurement through disposal, ensuring only authorized devices are allowed to access the organization's network and to protect the organization's data that is stored, processed, and transmitted on its assets. Number three, 
okay, so number two, assets. Um, I think about the IT team and you know their responsibility for managing assets. And if you are uh, a software development organization, maybe your software development or your DevOps team managing your production assets. All right, number three, business continuity and disaster recovery, which I think will impact your security teams, your ops teams, um, maybe your IT teams as well. So let's talk about this. Maintain the capability to sustain business critical functions while successfully responding to and recovering from incidents through a well-documented and exercised process. Organizations establish processes that will help the organization recover from an adverse situations with a minimal impact to operations as well as provide the ability for e-discovery. Number four, capacity and performance planning. I think it's fun as I go through each of these for me to think to myself, do I do this? Does someone in my organization do this? And I'm wondering if you ask yourself the same question. Number four, capacity and performance planning. Govern the current and future capacities and performance of technology assets. Organizations preventable, prevent avoidable business interruptions caused by capacity and performance limitations by proactively planning for growth and forecasting, as well as requiring both technology and business leadership to maintain situational awareness of current and future performance. Number five, change management. Govern change is a sustainable and ongoing manner that involves active participation from both technology and business stakeholders to ensure that only authorized changes occur. Organizations ensure both technology and business leadership proactively manage change. This includes the assessment, authorization, monitoring of technical changes across the enterprise so as to not impact production systems uptime as well as allow easier troubleshooting of issues. And I see change management often as a problem for the less mature organization, aka doesn't really exist. May, it may on paper, it may pass compliance, but not really. Number six, cloud security. I'm very happy to see, by the way, cloud security is here because it's not necessarily in every framework that you'd expect it to be. Govern cloud instances as an extension of on-premise technologies with equal or greater security protections than the organization's own internal controls. Organizations govern the use of private and public cloud environments like IaaS, PaaS, or SaaS, SaaS. Software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, to holistically manage risks associated with third-party involvement in architectural decisions, as well as to ensure the portability of data to change cloud providers if needed. Seven is compliance. So the ones we did as number one was not compliance. That was just governance. Interesting. Seven is compliance. Oversee the execution of cybersecurity and privacy controls to create appropriate evidence of due care and due diligence demonstrating compliance with all applicable statutory, regulatory, and contractual obligations. Organizations ensure controls are in place to be aware of and comply with applicable statutory, regulatory, and contractual compliance obligations, as well as internal company standards. Number eight, configuration management. Govern the establishment and ongoing management of secure configurations for systems, applications, and services according to vendor-recommended and industry-recognized security practices. Organizations establish and maintain the integrity of systems. Without properly documented or implemented configuration management controls, security features can be inadvertently or deliberately omitted or rendered inoperable allowing processing irregularities to occur or the execution of malicious code. Number nine, continuous monitoring. Maintain situational awareness of security-related events through the centralized collection and analysis of event logs from systems, applications, and services. Organizations establish and maintain ongoing situational awareness across the enterprise through the centralized collection and review of security-related event logs. Without comprehensive visibility into infrastructure, operating system, database, application, or other logs, the organization will have blind spots. 
in its situational awareness that could lead to system compromise, data exfiltration, or, un or unavailability of needed computing resources. And that was number nine, continuous monitoring. Number 10, cryptographic protections. Utilize appropriate cryptographic solutions and industry-recognized key management practices to protect the confidentiality and integrity of sensitive data both at rest and in transit. Organizations ensure the confidentiality of the organization's data through implementing appropriate cryptographic technologies to protect systems and data. Number 11, data classification and handling. Publish and enforce a data classification methodology to objectively determine the sensitivity and criticality of all data and technology assets so that proper handling and disposal requirements can be followed. Organizations ensure that technology assets, both hardware and media, are properly classified and measures implemented to protect the organization's data from unauthorized disclosure, regardless of it being transmitted or stored. Applicable statutory, regulatory, and contractual compliance requirements dictate the minimum safeguards that must be in place to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. So we just finished the first column. So as we are continuing on with the security and privacy by design principles of the secure control framework, we're at number 12, embedded technology. All right, here's one that jumps out to me as, oh, I don't think I've been doing this one. I, the others that we've gone through thus far, I could honestly speak to. Do this one, don't do this one well, but sort of do it. And then others which um, um, doing them very poorly, but definitely know I need to do better. Here's a good example of one that we're going to read about that don't think I'm doing a whole heck of a lot. Uh, maybe it just doesn't align with my business as much as it might yours. So number 12 is embedded technology. Provide additional scrutiny to the risks associated with embedded technology based on the potential damages posed when used maliciously. Organizations specify the development, proactive management, and ongoing review of security embedded technologies, including hardening of the stack from the hardware to firmware, software, transmission, and service protocols used for Internet of Things and operational technology. IOT and OT devices. Yeah, that is actually an area of improvement for me generally. Um, curious if it, uh, how that is for you all. Number 13, lucky number 13, endpoint security. I know and love this one all too well. Uh, harden endpoint devices to protect against reasonable threats and those devices and the data they store, transmit, and process. Organizations ensure that endpoint devices are appropriately protected from security threats to the device and its data. Applicable statutory, regulatory, and contractual compliance requirements dictate the minimum safeguards that must be in place to protect the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and safety considerations. Number 14, human resources security. I definitely have gotten into this one quite a bit over the last two years. Curious if others have. Foster a security and privacy-minded workforce through sound hiring practices and ongoing personnel management. Organizations create a security and privacy-minded workforce and an environment that is conducive to innovation, considering issues such as culture, reward, and collaboration. It's kind of the thought of, are you working with your chief people officer closely to bring security into the culture of the business? Don't do it yourself. Work with your partners. Number 15, identification and authentication. This is kind of the space that I got into security in, the identity and access management space. Let's read through what number 15 is. Implement an identity and access management, or IAM, capability to ensure the concept of least privilege is consistently implemented across all systems. Yes, I said I capitalized all, all systems. Uh, I think many organizations have an IAM implementation of sorts that covers some systems. <laughs> this requirement here talks about all systems. Now, let me continue on. 
uh, all systems, applications, and services for individual, group, and service accounts. Organizations implement the concept of least privilege through limiting access to the organization's systems and data to authorized users only. Um, I think of uh, identity access management, uh, something I used to say many, many years ago when I first got into security uh, for an identity governance company. And uh, I would help describe the concept of it, which is I want you, the user, uh, of our of our organization of our systems to have the access to absolutely everything you need to do your job. I want you to have all the access you need to do your job. Make them feel good, right? I want you to have everything to do your job, and not an ounce more than that. Nothing more than that. Least privilege. That's how I I like to describe least privilege. People get it. I want you to have all the access. I don't want you to be limited at all. I want you to have every piece of access you need to do your job but I want you to have absolutely nothing more than that. And then I will find a quick way for you to get the access you need as quick as possible whenever you need some new access. Moving on to number 16, incident response. I wouldn't be surprised if many of us have to deal with incident response, whether or not we have good sound principles around it. We're dealing with it. Here's the description. Maintain a practiced incident response capability that trains all users on how to recognize and report suspicious activities so that trained incident responders can take the appropriate steps to handle incidents in accordance with an incident response plan, or an IRP. Organizations establish and maintain a capability to Dis to guide oof. organizations established and maintain a capability to guide the organization's response when security or privacy related incidents occur and to train users how to detect and report potential incidents number 17 information assurance which here's an interesting thing in my earlier days of being in the information security industry uh, the organization I worked for did not have an information security department or information security function. We were all known as information assurance. And then over the years, the information assurance title went away and was switched into the information security title. And the organization I was at was actually one of the organizations that actually coined the term cybersecurity. And I actually watched department titles change from information assurance and then that title went away and it became the information security department and then that title went away and then the cybersecurity title of the department came in. Okay, number 17, information assurance. Utilize an impartial assessment process to validate the existence and functionality of appropriate security and privacy controls prior to a system, application, or service being used in a production environment. Organizations ensure the adequately uh, the adequately of security. Huh, interesting of how this was written here. I copied and pasted some things from the document. Um, ensure how adequately the security and controls are appropriate in both development and production environments. I had to make a little change on the fly there. That was information assurance. Number 17. Number 18. Maintenance. Oh, what a thought. Maintenance. What about the old stuff? Utilize secure practices to maintain technology assets according to current vendor recommendations for configurations and updates, including those supported or hosted by third parties. Organizations ensure that technology assets are properly maintained to ensure continued performance and effectiveness. Maintenance processes apply additional scrutiny to the security of end-of-life or unsupported assets. And folks... Uh, Windows 7 extended support is dead. It's gone, like as of last week, so get rid of it. Um, also, Windows 8.1, I think, is gone. Uh, or maybe it's in extended support, or maybe extended support's gone. Go check your Windows. Uh, make sure you got people on Windows 10 and beyond right now. Um, good example of maintenance. Number 19, mobile device management, another area that is uh, makes my heart warm. Uh, govern mobile devices through a centralized or decentralized model to restrict logical and physical access to the devices, as well as the amount and type of data that can be stored, transmitted, or processed. Organizations govern risk risks associated with mobile devices regardless if the device is owned by the organization. 
its users or trusted third parties. Wherever possible, technologies are employed to centrally manage mobile devices access and data storage practices, MDM, mobile device management. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the MDM field doing mobile security work, so that's why I say it warms my heart. Warms my heart. Number 20. We are still in column two, folks. Whew. Deep. Uh, network security. Uh, architect a defense in-depth me methodology that enforces the concept of least functionality through restricting network access to systems, applications, and services. Organizations ensure sufficient security and privacy controls are architected to protect the confidentiality, integrity, availability, and safety of the organization's network infrastructure, as well as to provide situational awareness of activity on the organizational organization's networks. Okay, I have some comments on this. Uh, when I got into my first large-scale information security job, my function, you know, big big company that was doing information security work, actually the company was MITRE, M-I-T-R-E, you might be familiar with the name, MITRE. Um, I found it interesting that many of the more senior folks in the information security org assumed all security engineers, information security engineers, were very strong and very adept in network security. And the truth was, it was probably my weakest of all the domains that we talked about. We were more talking about the CISSP domains. That's a topic for another day. Same concept. And I was surprised to find out that uh, there was this thought of like, oh, we're all good at firewalls and network security. I'm like, yeah, dude, not me, bro. I came in identity and access management, kind of goof around with applications a little bit. Um, but no. So uh, it was interesting. When I actually studied for the CISSP exam, uh, network security is a big component of that, and it was probably the area that I uh, had to put the most hours of study into. So uh, I guess just something to note, not everybody comes from the same background. That was number 20, network security. One other thing in that area that I thought was interesting, it talked about the CIA triad, right? When you look, if you go into Wikipedia and you search information security, It'll initially start, the, the, probably the first sentence we'll talk about, information security is defined by confidentiality, integrity, availability, the CIA triad. But in the SCF documentation, the Secure Controls Framework Start Here Guide, it brings a fourth item into this, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and safety. This is new to me. C-I-A-S, I have never heard C-I-A-S. It's always been the CIA triad. So I don't know if SCF is trying to add something new to this mix here, or maybe because they're squashing together so many different frameworks that it's more than just information security. But duly noted, SCF folks, you added S, and this is no longer a, a triad, which which messes with me, you know, my love for Legend of Zelda, because everything's a triangle, or the Triforce, or the triad. Okay, we're moving on. This is taking a long time. Number 21, physical and environmental security. Implement layers of physical security and environmental controls that work together to protect both, uh, where were we uh, to protect both physical and digital assets from theft and damage. Organizations minimize physical access to the organization's systems and data by addressing applicable physical security controls and ensuring that appropriate environmental controls are in place and continuously monitored to ensure equipment does not fail due to environmental threats. I have a lot of thoughts on this. One, if you are a cybersecurity leader, an information security leader, does physical security fall in your domain? It depends on the size of the organization was probably the answer. Um, many times physical security is just kind of like part of your facilities team. Um, sometimes physical security actually falls in your domain. I've seen it fall into the security team's domain uh, or the security team has pulled physical security into their domain. What I would say is it's one of the 32 different requirements of SCF and it is in many security frameworks. Make physical security part of your area of responsibility. Um, you're going to need to get certified or comply on it anyways. So maybe don't own it. Maybe let facilities continue to own it if that's who owns it. You know, facilities usually lives under HR, usually. 
let them continue to own it, but be a very close partner and at least bring them the requirements they need to do physical and environmental security. Moving on to number 22, privacy. Like privacy just gets its own category, just privacy. Implement a privacy program that ensures industry-recognized privacy practices are identified and operationalized throughout the life cycle of systems, applications, and services. Organizations align privacy engineering decisions with the organization's overall privacy strategy and industry-recognized leading practices to secure personal information, PI, not PII, not personally identifiable information, but personal information that implements the concept of privacy by design and by default. Sorry, I stopped mid-sentence because I never see PI, I always see PII, personally identifiable information. But in the SCF framework, they write PI, personal information. Interesting. And just making a note. Number 23, the last one in, uh, oh wait, we finished, we finished column two, column two. This is fantastic. Let me take another sip of coffee. I hope you're finding this as riveting as I am. Yes, I know I'm sounding facetious, but I actually do. I am enjoying reading through all of this content uh, and learning one slide on the screen for, it feels like, 8,000 hours. We're going to move to column two now. <laughs> and on column two, we are at project and resource management. Oh, here's an, this is another one that's kind of warmed my heart. Number 23. <clears throat> Utilize a risk-based approach to pri prioritize the planning and resourcing of all security and privacy aspects for projects and other initiatives to alleviate foreseeable governance, risk, and compliance roadblocks. Organizations ensure that security-related projects have both resource and project-slash-program management support to ensure successful project execution. <coughs> Uh, I believe a question was asked to me when I uh, took my first CISO role. And the question was, if I could, uh, it was actually from my CEO to me, was, hey, Sean, if I could give you one resource right now, one person, when I say resource, um, to hire, what would you hire? And I said, program manager. You know, like not, a, not an AppSec person, not a, not a security operations SOC person. I'm like, nope, program manager. Someone help us uh, stay organized. Uh, some to help us, you know, build processes that we can, uh, you know, build a list of backlog and uh, kind of build a, a risk-based approach, an organized approach to our backlog, to chip away at it, to uh, to help us determine, you know, what are our, our key metrics and uh, and whatnot. So uh, I'm a big fan of number 23. And 23 has actually given me some more thoughts on how I can actually mature my own concept around that. 24. Risk management. <clears throat> Govern a risk management capability that ensures risks are consistently identified, assessed, categorized, and appropriately remediated. Organizations ensure that security and privacy related risks are visible to and understood by the business units that own the assets and or processes involved. Security and privacy teams only advise and educate on risk management matters while it is business units and other key stakeholders who ultimately own the risk. So a couple thoughts on this. Uh, one, we are going to have an entire session coming up in a few weeks that is all about risk management. Uh, I believe risk management is extremely important to information security, no matter how uh, you got into the information security game. Uh, risk management may become you know, one of your number one pillars uh, of focus. And we'll talk about that in another day, but I believe it's critically important uh, for risk management. So it's not just number 24. It's kind of like really important. You may not focus on it in your first year, uh, but it's something you're going to want to focus on for the long haul to kind of keep your program running and focused and organized. So I actually think number 23 and number 24 are two really critical areas that aren't necessarily just focused around like finding a vulnerability and reducing it, uh, finding an incident and responding to it. <clears throat> All right, moving on, number 25, secure engineering and architecture. 
Uh, implement secure engineering and architecture processes to ensure industry-recognized secure practices are identified and operationalized throughout the life cycle of systems, applications, and services. Organizations align cybersecurity engineering and architecture decisions with the organization's overall technology, architectural strategy, and industry-recognized leading practices to secure networked environments. That's a whole lot of, whole lot of words here. Secure engineering, secure architecture. Um, yeah, to have a infrastructure security team, secure engineering team, a team that... Uh, or a function, I'm saying team, as if we have an in enormous organization. A function uh, focused around secure engineering, secure architecture. Um, you start to build that function over time, you start to realize, oh, I might need some dedicated resources around this. Uh, next one, 26, one that many of us are probably focused on more and more these days than ever before. Security operations. Uh, assign appropriately qualified personnel to deliver security and privacy operations that provide reasonable protective, detective, and responsive services. Organizations ensure appropriate resources and a management structure exists to enable the service delivery of cybersecurity operations. I expect that we will have a dedicated session in the future around security operations. I had the fortune of being the director of security operations at an e-commerce company, Demandware, for several years. Um, we actually acquired a few companies along the way and eventually got acquired by Salesforce and is now known as the Salesforce Commerce Cloud. So for quite some time after the acquisition, I held a security operations uh, director role uh, at Salesforce as well. Uh, so definitely quite a bit of experience in the SecOps space. I learned by lots of mistakes, made lots of mistakes, learned, grew, um, and even that whole space continues to change. Um, got a lot of thoughts about security operations uh, as it relates to smaller organizations and larger organizations and different ways they can be staffed uh, and funded. We'll talk about that in the future, most likely. Number, number 27, security awareness and training, SAT, security awareness training. Uh, but it's listed as security awareness and training. I like that. I like the and. I actually have not put the and in uh, security awareness and training. I like that because I don't necessarily love security awareness training. I like the and. Anyways, look at that. I'm just going to adopt an ampersand now. Develop a security and privacy-minded workforce through ongoing user education about evolving threats, compliance obligations, and secure workforce practices. Organizations develop a security and privacy-minded workforce through continuous education, activities, and practical exercises in order to refine and improve on existing training. Um, phishing campaigns. I hate them. I hate them so much. Yet they are required in compliance uh, programs. Uh, former colleague, industry friend Mike Johnson, um, probably heard him on other podcasts, uh, he talks about how he just doesn't even do them. He doesn't do phishing campaigns and tell his, tells his auditors, we don't do them. Nope. Um, but security awareness and training two different are, are a little bit different than just phishing, but a lot of people just think phishing campaigns and your annual security training program that you need everybody to take. Um, I think we'll have to focus on that at some point too. Number 28, technology development and acquisition. Technology development and acquisition. Govern the development process for any acquired or developed system, application, or service to ensure secure engineering principles are operationalized and functional. Organizations ensure that security and privacy principles are implemented into any products slash solutions that are either developed internally or acquired to make sure that the concepts of least privilege and least functionality are incorporated. Oh, I don't think I've heard about least functionality before. I might have to learn a little bit more about that. Thank you so much, SCF. Guys, we're rounding the bend here on the 32. We're on to number 29, third-party management. And I know in the world today, third-party risk management, TPRM, is the acronym that a lot of us uh, cry ourselves to sleep talking about. Let's see what SCF has to say about third-party management. Implement ongoing 
third-party risk management practices to actively oversee the supply chain so that only trustworthy third parties are used. Organizations ensure that security and privacy risks associated with third parties are minimized, are minimized and enable measures to sustain operations should a third party become defunct. I feel like we could spend a whole lot of time talking about third-party risk management as well. Um, starting with, I feel like it's a waste of time, at least how we're all doing it right now. Everybody asking everyone else for your compliance certifications and to answer 300 question questionnaires uh, from various security um, tools. Uh, we are wasting so much time in third-party risk management. And are we actually managing the risk? I don't think many of us are. I think we're just wasting time so our compliance teams can check a box. We got a lot to talk about on that, but I'm obviously critical that is in this framework. Number 30, threat management. Identify, assess, and remediate technology-related threats to assets in business processes based on a thorough risk analysis to determine the potential risk posed from the threat. Organizations establish a capability to proactively identify and manage technology-related threats to the security and privacy of the organization's systems, data, and business processes. Um, I just felt like that was a lot of words. <laughs> I just felt like threat management was a whole lot of words. Maybe I'll go back and think about that a little bit more. Two more to go. Uh, vulnerability and patch management. Utilize a risk-based approach to vulnerability and patch management practices that minimize the attack surface of systems, applications, and services. Organizations proactively manage the risks associated with the technical vulnerability management that includes ensuring good patch and change management practices are utilized. I feel like we could spend hours on this as well. I feel like I'll bring up a vulnerability and patch management episode in the future. Maybe we can talk about the tools out there like the Rapid7s, Tenables, Qualysys, you know, the typical third-party tools, but why not about the first party uh, and open source tools as well, you know, your Veracodes, your Sneaks, your Coverities and whatnot. I think we can do quite a bit over there. And rounding things out on the principles is web security at number 32. Govern all internet-facing technologies to ensure those systems, applications, and services are securely configured and monitored for anomalous activity. Organizations address the risks associated with internet-accessible technologies by hardening devices, monitoring systems' file integrity, enabling auditing and monitoring for malicious activities. Ladies and gentlemen, those are the secure control framework principles for security and privacy. And dang, that took a lot longer than I expected it would. <laughs> oh my goodness. It really did take a long time to get through it. We're not done yet, though. No, we still have more content. I just needed to take a breath after that. Those are the 32 principles. Um, we have a little bit more that we're going to get to today. We're going to finish the principles, and then we're going to talk about integrated controls management before we wrap up. So we're getting close to the end here of PowerPoint, or death by PowerPoint. Uh, so now, uh, SCF privacy management principles. Uh, through our interactions with organizations, this is, these are the words of the folks at SCF that I'm, that I'm reading from here. Uh, through our interactions with organizations, we've identified that many organizations understand the cybersecurity framework they wanted or needed to align with. For example, I mentioned uh, CIS critical security controls, ISO 27001, uh, NIST cybersecurity framework, or NIST 800-53. Um, many organizations understand the cybersecurity framework they wanted to, or needed to align to, but had no understanding of the privacy principles uh, the organization should be aligned with. And I could think many of us would be nodding our heads saying, yeah, privacy, doesn't legal do that? Uh, so the SCF team set out to fix that issue. And what they did was select over a dozen of the most common privacy frameworks to create a best-in-class approach to managing, managing privacy principles. The best part is these are all mapped to the SCF and built into the SCF 
so you can leverage the SCF for both your cybersecurity and privacy needs. Uh, I'd say a couple years ago, I would say, who cares? Right now, I'm actually kind of ex extremely excited about this because, again, I can work really closely with my legal team and our our DPO, our um, uh, our privacy officer, um, to help them with something that maybe they don't even know exists. All right, so why should you care? You can tie the broader security and privacy with the SCF privacy management principles that you have an excellent foundation for building, maintaining secure systems, applications, and services that address cybersecurity and privacy considerations by default and by design. Think of the SCF privacy management principles as a supplement to the security privacy by design to assist in defining and managing privacy principles based on selected privacy frameworks. It sounds a little confusing to me, but I, I like the idea, the way it's written. It sounds a little confusing, but I'm in. I'm actually in on this. This can enable your organization to align with multiple privacy frameworks that also map to your cybersecurity and privacy control set. Since we found the apples to oranges comparison between the disparate privacy frameworks was difficult for most non-privacy practitioners to comprehend. And I will consider myself a non-privacy practitioner who's kind of found their way into privacy, but uh, I wouldn't say I came by way of privacy. And so there are 16 different frameworks um, that the SCF privacy management principles are mapped to. And I'm just going to read the names out. I'm not going to read them in all detail like we did at uh, the other principles. Um, they are the, uh, the SOC 2 trust services criteria, the APEC, which is the Asia-Pacific Asia Economic Cooperation, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act, EU GDPR, uh, the Fair Information Practice Principles, which is a part of uh, Department of Homeland Security and the Office of Management and Budget, OMB. Um, GAP, Generally Accepted Privacy Principles. The HIPAA Privacy Rule is included in this as well. Uh, ISO 27701 and ISO 29100, both privacy-focused ISO frameworks. Uh, the Nevada Privacy, which is the SB 820, uh, NIST, uh, NIST 800-53 in, in the most recent REVs. Uh, NIST also has a separate privacy framework. It's almost like there's too much. Um, as well as the PIPEDA, the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. Um, of these 16 different privacy frameworks that were assessed, uh, what the SCF folks did in this privacy management principle, they organized it into 11 domains. And here's the 11 domains. You don't see them on the screen, but I'm going to read them to you. Privacy by design, data subject participation, limited collection and use, transparency, data lifecycle management, data subject rights, security by design, incident response, risk management, third-party management, and finally, business environment. So these are all privacy management principles. Again, I'm confused as to why this is separate from what we just looked at a few minutes ago, but I am completely sold on the concept. Bring it all in. Bring it all into one framework. I'll do all our security stuff and all of our privacy stuff, and I'll bring the privacy stuff to the legal team. I'll bring the, probably the legal team, our privacy person from the legal team, over so they can be a part of this with us. I'm all in. Let's move on. I think our last section of today in Death by PowerPoint is the integrated controls management. So the ICM is a joint project between the SCF and Compliance Forge. Uh, Compliance Forge is a leader in providing cybersecurity and pro uh, privacy documents and templates. Uh, in a future session, we'll probably go over uh, Compliance Forge, uh, their cybersecurity governance framework. The premise of the ICM is that controls are central to cybersecurity and privacy operations, as well as the overall business rhythm of the organization. This is supposed to be, th this is, sorry, this is supported by the security and privacy risk management model. Uh, that describes the centralized nature of controls, where not just policies and standards map to controls, but procedures, metrics, threats, and risks as well. Uh, we'll briefly go over the 
um, risk management module um, next time we get together. Uh, maybe we'll do a deep dive later too. So ICM is a controls, it's control centric where controls are viewed as the nexus or central pivoting point for an organization's cybersecurity and privacy operations. ICM is designed to proactively address the strategic, operational, and tactical nature of operating an organization's cybersecurity and privacy program at the control level. ICM is designed to address both internal controls as well as the broader concept of supply chain risk management, which is hot, hot, hot. So applying the ICM to GRC functions. So much acronym, so much, so much word. Uh, GRC can be a costly and labor-intensive endeavor. So what justifies the investment? Essentially, GRC functions help avoid negligence with the added benefit of improved IT, cyber, privacy operating effectiveness. The reality of the situation is your company invests in cybersecurity and privacy as a necessity. The necessity is driven in large part by laws, regulations, and contractual requirements that it is legally obligated to comply with. It is also driven by the desire to protect its public image from damaging acts that happen when cybersecurity and privacy practices are ignored. Regardless of the specific reason, those charged with developing, implementing, and running your organization's cybersecurity and data protection program must do so in a reasonable manner that would withstand scrutiny that could take the form of an external auditor, regulator, or prosecuting attorney lawyers were just mentioned. How fast would you drive your car if you didn't have any brakes? Think about it for a moment. Would you likely drive at a crawl in first gear? And even then, would you invariably have accidents as you bump into objects and other vehicles to slow down? Brakes on a vehicle actually allow you to drive fast, in addition to safely navigating dangers on the road. While it is not the most flattering analogy, GRC is akin to the brakes on your car, where they enable the business operations to go fast to avoid catastrophic accidents. Without those brakes, an accident is a certainty. These brakes will that the brakes that enable a business operations to stay within the guardrails are its cybersecurity policies, standards, and procedures. These requirements constitute reasonable practices that the organizations are required to implement and maintain to avoid being negligent. So GRC is a plan, do, check, act adventure, PDCA. This is a concept that should be embraced, not fought against. GRC most often deals with legally binding requirements, so it is important to understand that negligence is situationally dependent. For example, an intoxicated driver who gets behind the wheel acting negligently. However, when sober, that same individual is a champion race car driver who is highly skilled and would not be considered incompetent in any regard. In this example, driving intoxicated constitutes a negligent act and shows that negligence has nothing to do with being incompetent. The point is to demonstrate that an organization can employ many highly competent personnel, but even competent personnel can behave in a negligent manner. GRC fundamentally exists to help an organization avoid circumstances that could be construed as negligent acts. Considering how business practices continually evolve, so must cybersecurity practices the plan, do, check, act process, um, also referred to as the Deming cycle. You may have seen that elsewhere. Uh, this process enables a GRC function to continuously uh, in evaluate risks, threats, and performance trends so that the organization's leadership can take the necessary steps to minimize risk by modifying how people, processes, and technology work together to keep everything both secure and operational. The plan, do, check, act approach is a logical way to conceptualize how GRC works. Plan. The overall process begins with planning. At its core, this phase is the process of conducting due diligence. The results of the process will define necessarily controls. Those will be your requirements that will influ influence the need for policies, standards, and procedures. These actions 
directly influence resourcing and procurement actions that range from staffing needs to tool purchases and services acquisition. Do. This phase is a process of conducting due care, where it is focused on the reasonable care necessary to properly and sufficiently conduct operations that demonstrate the absence of negligence. This is the execution of procedures, the processes that bring controls to life. And then there's check. Check. This phase can be considered maintaining. Uh, there are several ways to maintain situational awareness, and that ranges from control validation, testing to audits, assessments, and metrics. And then finally, act. This phase, again, brings up the concept of reasonable care that necessitates taking action to maintain the organization's targeted risk tolerance threshold. Uh, this deals with addressing two main topics, real deficiencies that currently exist and two areas of concern that may expose the organization to a threat if no action is taken. So what does it mean to be secure and compliant? ICM specifically focuses on the need to understand and clarify the difference between compliant versus secure, since that is necessary to have coherent risk management discussions. To assist in this, this, in this process, ICM helps an organization categorize its applicable controls according to must-have versus nice-to-have requirements. The minimum compliance criteria, or MCC, are the absolute minimum requirements that must be addressed to comply with applicable laws, regulations, and contracts. Discretionary security requirements, DSR, are tied to the organization's risk appetite since DSR are above and beyond the MCC, where the organization self-identifies additional cybersecurity and data protection controls to address voluntary industry practices or internal requirements such as findings from internal audits or risk assessments. So this is a good way to define what are your must-haves and your nice-to-haves. The premise is that controls are central to cybersecurity and privacy operations, as well as business rhythms of the organization. Without properly defining your MCC and your DSR thresholds, an organization's overall cybersecurity and privacy program is placed in jeopardy as the baseline practices are not anchored to clear requirements. Furthermore, understanding and clarifying the difference between compliant versus secure, MCC being compliant, MCC plus DSR being secure enhances risk management discussions. I love this so much. Um, I've always followed along with the model of your must-haves and your nice-to-haves, and it came from me doing uh, security engineering for the, the government. Um, but I don't think I actually leveraged this type of definition of, of must-haves and um, those that are focused around uh, regulatory uh, legal and contractual requirements being your must-haves. I, I, I love that. And uh, I feel like it was a piece that I needed to add on to my, uh, my knowledge. And uh, I found it was very helpful for me. Hopefully you do as well. IT general controls. Why is this in here? Let's find out. Uh, ITG, ITGC is the cool kids call it. The combination of the MCC and DSR, your must-haves and your nice-to-haves, uh, equate to an organization's minimum security requirements, which define the must-have and nice-to-have requirements for people, process, technology, and data in one control set. Here's another example of the Secure Controls Framework changing an acronym that I knew very well, PPT, People, Process, and Technology. But they added one, the letter D, People, Process, Technology, and Data. That is new to me. It defines the minimum viable product, the MVP, technical and business requirements from a cybersecurity and privacy perspective. In short, the MSR, again, you know, there's your MSR, which is your minimum security requirements, can be considered to be the organization's IT governance controls, the ITGC, which, in, which establish the basic controls that must be applied to systems, applications, services, processes, and data throughout the enterprise. ITGC provides the foundation of assurance for an organization's decision makers. ITGC enables an organization's governance function to define how technologies are designed, implemented, and operated. I 
find this is a, a great um, a great add-on to just the controls that we talked about. Good on you, SCF team. Here's the ICM principles. There are actually eight principles, um, and kind of tough to see on this slide here, uh, but this comes from Compliance Forge. So you can actually get this image uh, in a PDF at complianceforge.com. But the eight principles are establish context, define applicable controls, assign maturity-based criteria, publish policies, standards, and procedures, assign stakeholder accountability, maintain situational awareness, manage risks, and evolve processes. And there's details about all eight of these. And maybe we'll get into those on a further um, episode. But I think we've covered a good overview today of what is Secure Control Framework. I learned a lot. I hope you learned a little bit. And ladies and gentlemen, for today, that is our death by PowerPoint. <laughs>